Okay, thanks a million, David. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, my name is Darren Cunningham, as David said, and I'm a co-founder and CEO of one of Ireland's newest biotech companies, Inflection Biosciences. So, first of all, can everybody hear me okay? Uh, okay. Down the back in particular, I've always wanted to ask that question. Can you all hear me down the back? Good. So, um, so I'm going to tell you a bit about the story of Inflection Biosciences and my own personal story today. And I'm, I'm kind of tempted to ask uh, people in the audience here uh, to, to raise their hands about who would, have a, who would have an inclination to set up a biotech company and then maybe to ask that question at the end and see, see what, I, what have I done to your, to your uh, dreams and ambitions. But, but it is, it's not a straightforward um, it's not a straightforward journey to set up a biotech here in Ireland, but I mean the rewards can be enormous. So David asked me to come in and speak to uh, my own personal story, a bit about the company, and and some of my own personal remarks on on my takeaways from the story so far. So I hope I hope they're going to be of some use to some of you, and of course if there are any questions at the end, I'd be delighted to uh, take those. So I, I I start with this because I, I am an accountant and. Uh, when this comes up in conversation and you know you're, I'm CEO of a biotech company and, and that, I get that question all the time you're an accountant you know so uh, so I think that's part of the story that you're going to hear today so with that I will start by going through my journey and 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 I think this all this kind of journey and, and I'm sure all all the entrepreneurs who come in have their story about how they got to their current uh, their current status. So I'll, I'll take you through mine and some of the key, the key points along the way. So I'm from Galway, uh, in the west of Ireland here. Um, and I lived there until I was 21. I went to Jesuit College in Galway. I come from a, a family business background. Uh, nothing got to do with biotech, but I, I will revert to that kind of uh, background uh, towards the end of the slides. Um, I've got a commerce degree from NUIG, and then I've got a master's uh, in accountancy, uh, which is a very interesting master's. Um, uh, a master's in accountancy from the uh, Smurfit Business School in UCD. Then I went on to do my articles, uh, became a qualified chartered accountant with Price Waterhouse Coopers. Um, and again, in doing that, my ambition was never to be a full time accountant, but I fully recognized the, uh, the platform that that would give, certainly in the, in the area of management. Uh, and that turned out to be the case. So a, a, a tremendous place to, uh, to, you know, to step forward from the university setting into into the in, into commerce and into business. So my first, uh, I suppose, real job then, if you want to call it that, uh, well, after spending a year in, in Australia, my first real job was back here in Ireland with a company called Dimplex. Now I don't know if if you know who Dimplex are, but they're uh, one of Ireland's biggest and most successful private Irish companies. And they are responsible for such products as uh, Morphe Richards, you might have heard of, Belling, um, and they make most of the, uh, the, the radiators that you see in most buildings today in Ireland. So, very successful. So, I was there for a year and a half, and my role there was, um, I was a group finance executive. And the decision making for me to take that job uh, was the first, first opportunity to segue from the, the kind of normal co course for an accountant, which is to end up in financial reporting, to move into M&A. So at, at Dimplex, it was highly uh, M&A focused, mergers and acquisitions focused. So I went into the M&A team, and that got me into the corporate finance side of things. Um, so that's kind of where I wanted to get to as, as a first port of call. The challenge for me at Dimplex was that I really wasn't that interested in understanding how radiators are made. I wasn't really that interested in uh, getting to grips with the, with the mechanism of action of a, uh, a hairdryer. So there was a bit of a mismatch for me personally that, that uh, there had to be more to your day-to-day -day job th than this. I, I think the lesson there for me was that you really had to enjoy what you were doing and, and that was always a mantra of mine and, and you know, working in this industry, uh, it, it just wasn't doing it for me on that personal side, although having said that, the company is, is a tremendous success and I had great experience there. Uh, what I would also say about Dimplex is that, you know, that decision to, uh, to kind of pursue the kind of work that I wanted to do, it, it came at a bit of a cost. It, it wasn't the easiest uh, decision to make in that I could have taken a financial reporting job in the city. Uh, I could have walked to work and worked with one of the, uh, one of the banks or something. Whereas working with Dimplex involved a 50 mile drive to and from every day up to, uh, up to Dunlear. 
so it meant I was leaving at half six in the morning and coming back at uh, at um, at about half nine at night uh, for, for a year and a half and during the course at Diplex I spent six months commuting to Nuremberg in Germany so there was a lot of, lot of sacrifice there but all the time I knew and I had to believe myself that this was the right way to get me the right uh, decision to get me to where I wanted to get to in terms of the work that I wanted and ultimately that opened up the door to an opportunity at Elan Corporation now I don't know if anybody here has heard of Elan but Elan is, uh, I suppose, one of Ireland's most uh, famous indigenous pharma companies and, and uh, in its history it's had some great success and, and some great disappointments, but overall it, it, a tremendous uh, uh, story from, from an Irish pharma point of view. So while at Elan, there was then an opportunity to join a company called Amarin Corporation, which was a smaller NASDAQ-focused company, uh, and, and the attraction for me to leave the relative safety of Elan as it was at the time, before it, it hit turbulent waters um, back in 2002, was that I, instead of being part of a team of very bright people at, at Elan, where I was writing my reports and reporting on, not really having much of a say in what was going on in the company, as, as how I perceived it, to working in a, in a smaller indigenous or a smaller UK um, biotech company, NASDAQ listed company, where I was reporting directly to the CEO. And so now myself and the CEO were making the decisions on the strategic focus of the company. Uh, so at this stage I was in, in my, uh, I suppose, mid to late 20s, um, spent eight years there and, and, and from day one again it was starting to check a lot, a lot of the boxes in terms of uh, uh, you know, understanding the industry, getting exposure to the industry, traveling around the world, uh, making important decisions that shape the company. Um, so again, starting to fuel what was clearly an, an, uh, an, an inner quest, I suppose, to, to be in charge. And, and so I was getting closer to it here now. So all the way, this is what was happening along my track. So after eight years at Amarin, we, uh, our last role in Amarin was to raise 70 million. Um, I was head of investor relations at this time, so I was heavily involved with the fundraising. We raised 70 million in a, in a private placement from VCs, uh, some of the biggest blue chip biotech uh, investors in the world. Um, and uh, one of the conditions effectively was that the, uh, the, the head office in Dublin would be significantly downsized, so there was no longer a need for a corporate finance, fundraising, business development team. And with that, that was the end of the road, uh, on, on the back of that successful fundraising, that was the end of the road for most of us at Amarin in, in Dublin. So, so for the first time now, I was facing a situation where I had no immediate job lined up. Uh, I now ha I had uh, two children at this stage, two, two, young, two young boys with my wife. And I, I uh, set out uh, looking at what I would do, and I realized I actually didn't really know many people in Ireland. Because on my Rolodex, although you don't call it Rolodex anymore, my Outlook, my Microsoft Outlook was populated with uh, US-based uh, people because that's the focus of Amron and Elan was very US uh, orientated. So I had a lot of work to do to figure out where am I going to go from here. I was asking questions like should I move to the States uh, where my skills and expertise and, and uh, contacts w could be of great use and work for a biotech company in the States. Um, but, you know, ultimately I, I wanted to try and find an avenue where I could stay at home uh, in, in Ireland. Now along the way I did, uh, I had to, uh, I suppose, face up to a situation where I was offered a job in uh, 2010. And, and this now was an important decision. If I took this job, um, I could still be in it today and I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now, but it would have put me on a certain track. So at that point, at the age of, uh, at the age of well, late, late, uh, late thirties, two kids and another one on the way at that point, uh, <laughs> I decided to say no to salary and security. And, uh, and I, I figured now was the time. And you know, maybe there's never a right time, maybe there's never a wrong time, but for me, this was the time to, to give it a go. And, and, and I, as I always said to myself, let's not get to say age, whatever, 50 and think, why didn't I try this? So there was a lot on the line here. I was giving up a security. I still had to think about the family situation and I had no real prospect of what I was going to do, but I turned down the job and uh, I faced into the abyss at that point. So 
But then I got a couple of calls from a couple of companies looking for help on doing some, some indigenous Irish companies who had no business development experience or expertise, who had been approached by other pharma companies, and they didn't know how to, to uh, execute that deal. And I was referred in to help them out. So I set up Live Science Ventures, which was a consulting business. Um, and I put a lot of work into kind of branding that and positioning it, but it was really myself uh, offering my services. And that was my first foray into, uh, into, I suppose, backing myself now. So I had no brand, I had no Amarin brand, I had no Elan brand. This was now me trying to generate revenue and trying to execute on behalf of clients. So there was a lot to be achieved in that. And I did succeed in 2011 in executing some uh, fairly high profile opportunity uh, uh, transactions for indigenous um, medical device company and pharma company here in, in Ireland. So I took a great amount of uh, satisfaction from that, that you know, you know I, the stuff that I was doing at Ameren, I can certainly do on my own. It wasn't the Ameren brand. But again, looking at what, what I was doing at that point, again in, in, 20, uh, in, in 2010, in the first part of 2011, you know, as a consultant, and maybe there, there may be some of you who may think about being a consultant or maybe have it as part of your, uh, of your vision at some point, and you know, consulting does have pros and cons, and the pros, you get to uh, meet a lot of different companies, a lot of different people, and get to learn different uh, industries and technologies. However, I suppose for me at the core of it was that you were leveraging your own expertise to bring value to, a, to an entrepreneur or to, to a company. And, you, and as, as the consultant, you're on the outside, and you're not really capturing that value. So all that work and all those contacts that you're leveraging you're just not capturing that value for yourself to the same, even though you're getting fees and whatever, it's not the same. So ultimately, uh, it was, for me, it was always gonna be about setting up my own company. And uh, I won't go into too much detail to the story of how we ultimately uh, got, got to co-founding uh, Inflection Biosciences, but it went through a couple of turns and I ultimately partnered up with a, an Irish guy based in London who has a drug development background, so he brought the life science skill set and I had the, the fundraising business development uh, skills and we founded Inflection Biosciences. And so the, the, the next part of the presentation is going to talk about um, the challenges and, and the, the trials and tribulations of setting up biotech. And uh, I'm going to do my best to try and position this in a way just to give you a sense of if you were in my shoes and you're trying to raise money, for example, what, what, what kind of thought process uh, is involved with that. So. Um, so when I mentioned this, you know, even at home or, or to my friends, and I spoke about setting up a biotech, um, so now it's, okay, you're an accountant, and now you're going to set up a biotech uh, in Ireland. So, you know, you got the feeling that, hmm, should I be reading between the lines here? Um, so again, it would have been easy just to say, maybe, maybe I should listen to, to what I'm hearing here. Um, and for good reason, you know, some of these people, uh, uh, explaining, you know, you know, you got to be careful here. This is this is a difficult sell. It's a long journey, and you know, raising money is going to be difficult. And why is that? And for for those of you who are not familiar with the drug development process, I'm just going to uh, talk to this for a moment. So, um, for every 10,000 discoveries in, in the world, in, in the in the pharma space or in the biotech space, one gets approved. Okay, so. So that's pretty difficult, you know. Not only that, it takes 10 to 15 years to know that you have an approval, okay? And uh, it can cost on average one billion. So if you were to stack that up probably against uh, an app story or an ICT story, I think that would look very different. So, <coughs> so let, me, let me bear that in mind and let me put that another way. So you may recognize some of these guys. The, the, this is the Dragon's Den. And uh, so you can imagine me pitching inflection biosciences to, uh, to these guys. And I don't know if you watch this program, but normally guys are going in with, with a, a food product or something that is immediately revenue generating or they already have revenue, okay? So l let's, let's play this out for a moment just to, to put in context what this would look like. So you'd have um, Sean here, Sean Gallagher would say, uh, so Darren, uh, on average, what's the time to market for, for a discovery? Um, and I'd say, oh, you know, about 15 years, okay? And then, um, what's this guy's name again, anybody? Okay, Gavin, yes, 
Well done. Gavin would say, so Darren, uh, can you talk to me about the, the, the statistics, the, you know, for every discovery, what's the probability of success? And I go, well, Gavin, it's about 10,000 to one. And uh, so then, uh, <laughs> So then uh, Nora here would say, uh, and, and so tell me a bit about the cost, you know, to get, to get your drug to the market, well, what are we talking about here now? Uh, you know, they've got their uh, 100K on the table here, okay, or their 50K. And I'll say, you know, yeah, about a billion dollars, you know, on average to get to the market. <coughs> so at this point, um, what's this guy's name? Bobby is laughing, and, and I think that the, the pitch will be over at this stage. And, uh, and, um, uh, our guy here would be saying, uh, our guy here would be saying, don't give up the day job, as they like to say, you know. So that, that's, that's what it would look like, you know. That's a very difficult sell. So, you know, there had, to be, there had to be a rationale, there had to be a different approach, in my view. And I wasn't going to get into the, 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 the biotech space without having something different. There had to be an angle. So, we spent a lot of time, uh, myself and my business partner and, and, and another co-founder, we spent a lot of time looking at where is the opportunity for an indigenous company or, or a startup company to get to an exit point that's not, not 15 years down the track. That's not going to take a um, billion dollars, okay? And, uh, and that's, it's not going to be 10,000 to one. So, so we had to take that all into account and, and, and also what therapeutic area and what have you. So this is the inflection biosciences approach. We, we looked at, this is the drug development process, can you see that at the top, from discovery, all the different phases, there's about, I don't know, 10 or 12 phases all the way to launch, typically 10 to 15 years. So we said, well look, well we started from, from here, we identified that in the cancer space, in oncology, in the cancer space, at phase one, because uh, cancer drugs are so potent and so toxic, generally speaking, because they're, they're manipulating cells in the body, you generally can't recruit healthy volunteers into a phase one study, okay? Which means that you actually have uh, cancer patients in your first 20 to 50 patient study. What does that mean? So typically for phase one, you're, you're in, in first human studies, you're checking the safety of the drug, but because you now have cancer patients, you can actually get a sense of, are you actually treating the cancer? Are you, are you getting a signal of efficacy? Now, because of that difference, because of that difference, um, this is a huge, a potentially, I should say, huge inflection point in the drug development process for cancer drugs, okay? So knowing that, we said, okay, well, let's, let's go about trying to find an opportunity that's about three to four years from that point, okay? So not, not going back to maybe the university setting and saying, what technology do you have? We said, okay, well, what? What kind of opportunity do we need that's going to get us, in three to four years' time, uh, an opportunity that can be at that kind of value creation proposition? And that's what we did. Uh, we we uh, spent a year and a half without pay. And this is, you know, at this stage now I had four children. And uh, the bills kept coming in. And uh, um, we had looked at 150 opportunities. We got in touch with about 200 uh, institutes around the world. And at one point, I remember turning to my uh, business colleague and saying, um, maybe, our, maybe our criteria is a bit stringent, you know? Because uh, at this stage, I was thinking we need to start getting some fundraising going, we need to get some salary in. So, but we decided to stick to our guns and ultimately we, uh, we secured an asset. Um, we secured an asset from, that I'm gonna show you in due course. So b before I finish off from the model, um, so phase one, I mentioned that's a big inflection point. Let me tell you how big that is. Here's our three examples of small biotech companies that were three to four years old that got their drug to phase one. So Takeda, one of the big Japanese pharma companies, acquires, uh, spends 310 million to buy Intellikine. 310 million, okay, dollars. Celgene spends 350 million for a phase one stage company in cancer. Same here again, 325 million. And I think this one had contingent payments as well, brought it up to a billion dollars. So on average, these companies had, had a spend of about 10 to 15 million dollars and were about three to four years old. So maybe you're getting a sense of the picture here that for a spend of about 10 million, you can potentially, potentially sell the company for several hundred million. That's what I liked about it. And there are some of my favorite slides, uh, given my finance background. 
So as I, I described, we set about searching for the right opportunity to execute the first step, was, which was to license in the right type of asset. And um, we ultimately um, concluded a deal with a very prestigious uh, National Cancer Research Institute in Spain, and this is based in Madrid. It's a very impressive operation. Remember, we walked into these doors here, myself and Michael, um, no money, no company, no legal entity, and uh, we, we just set about um, putting on a show and, and describing our vision. And, uh, and, and uh, a year later, a year of building a relationship, a year of demonstrating our skill sets and our networks mm -hmm. and our contacts, we ultimately announced a license deal with the CNIO in June of this year. So this was a major breakthrough for Inflection Biosciences. Because that was the first question, how could, how could you license a drug? Who would give you assets? And this is it. So, some signs from the finance guy, okay? So, at a very simple, this is going to insult some people's intelligence, no doubt, in the room, but uh, what is cancer generally? I mean, th these were some of the learnings I had to go through, but generally speaking, um, it's when you have an uncontrolled division of cells. Uh, out of control, cancer is formed. Um, what is a kinase? Anybody heard of a kinase? Okay, good, I'll take that as a yes. So, in essence, this is a... Uh, you had to learn this stuff off by heart, you know. Um, There's an enzyme that, that regulates cell function, cell division, cell signaling, okay? So in, in, in its normal uh, function operation, it's, it's a necessary enzyme, but um, when out of control or mutated, it, uh, it is directly a direct contributor to cancer. So what is a kinase inhibitor? It's a drug that inhibits cancer. So if you've identified a malfunctioning kinase that's uh, that's sending nasty signals to the cells to divide. Well, if you develop a drug that focuses in on that kinase, shuts it down, you're, you're delivering a therapeutic treatment, okay? So what have we got at Inflection Biosciences? What we licensed from the National Cancer Research Institute in uh, Spain are um, programs, molecules that target PIM kinases and PI3 kinases. So PIM kinases, I expect maybe nobody's heard of these before, but these have been shown, the PIM enzyme and protein has been shown to be hugely overexpressed in a number of uh, cancers, particularly hematological uh, malig malignancies, uh, multiple myeloma, and, um, diffuse B cell, and, and the like. And this is an emerging area of interest, this is an emerging uh, clinical uh, target, and you've got AstraZeneca and Novartis currently uh, producing positive results in phase one. So this is a quick snapshot of the pipeline that we've licensed at Inflection Biosciences. What's, uh, what's common here is that they all have PIM. So we are very much the PIM company, but the first one is PIM alone. The next one is a single molecule that, tar that shuts down two pathways, PIM and PI3 kinase. And there's some very good strategic rationale for why that should be of great interest to the sector. And very similar, this is the same kind of thing except with what, some mTOR, a different kind of enzyme and activity and signaling is introduced. So one molecule with three three uh, areas of activity and targeting. Um, so if you take one of our molecules, IBL-101, this is just the pan-PIM kinase inhibitor, so this is the selective single targeting molecule. Uh, what we see in a very difficult non-small uh, lung cancer, uh, lung carcinoma model is a, is a complete elimination or, um, uh, of, the, of growth of, of the tumor. So you know, this is very promising and this is with a uh, this is with a suboptimal formulation of our drug, and in fact, we, we would say that uh, this is not even our, our lead uh, opportunity. So this is, this is good data, and this is promising and attracting interest. So the key priorities for the company over the next while are to simply raise 10 million, okay? We've raised half a million so far, so we're well on the way. Um, so this will allow us to get to that, that value point in the model that I showed you, to get to phase one. Um, it's going to take approximately 10 million uh, euro or possibly 10 million dollars and that's going to be the opportunity for us to crystallize the value so very straightforward and um, okay so at this point I'm going to switch gear I'm getting towards the end of the presentation now so I'm going to I suppose reflect and come back to some of the some of the starting and opening comments um, Given that this is focused on entrepreneurship, there's some, some statements or some input from, from myself here that, that may be of interest. So, you know, what, what helps, you know, to, to set up a biotech company in the face of uh, 
some of the challenges that I set out in the context of, of raising money for this type of industry, what kind of, uh, what kind of personality traits and character traits do I think are necessary, and, and you may agree or disagree, and I'm sure some of your entrepreneurs have touched on all of this in, in, in the past. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I do think you have to be a, a bit of a dreamer, or you certainly have to have ambition. And, and uh, the, this, this Hollywood sign, I use this as a little story, uh, it's a prompt to remind me of, of uh, I mentioned at the start that I come from a family business background, and that, I suppose, has programmed me somehow to always want to, uh, to, be, to be in control somewhat or, or to uh, take charge of my own business. So, uh, clearly, my, my father w was the entrepreneur in, in our family, and, and his ultimate dream was not, he, his trade was a printer. Back in the 50s, you know, people got trades. Uh, trades were the professions back then, in Ireland in any event. And, uh, but his dream was not to be a printer, it was to, to be a movie star. So he had absolutely zero training. He had zero basis on which to be a movie star, but he saved up money in, in the early 1960s and flew to Hollywood. And his, his, uh, his strategy was to be spotted. So I think we probably have a bit more strategy on, on our company at the moment, but, uh, but ultimately that didn't work for him, um, but he had a great time out there. <laughs> and uh, he did get to rub shoulders with some of the movie stars. Um, he hung out in Sunset uh, Boulevard and all the rest of it. And uh, so he'll always have that. While he was there, he set up a printing company. And he brought that back to Ireland and became hugely successful when printing was a good industry to be in. So you have to take a chance. You have to have drive. You have to be a bit of a dreamer. And uh, I think they're important attributes. I spoke about the, the role in Dimplex, and this is just mapping out you know, the choices I had about going from a, a job that was just around the corner a to B here in Dublin City versus driving up to Dimplex, uh, and, um, which I did for a year and a half, and the amount of accidents and ambulances and stuff I saw on the road was, was not pretty. But I, the point here was that you know, it's, they're never the easy decisions. I mean, to, to set up a company, it's, there are difficult decisions there, and uh, you need to persevere. And uh, this is the special one. I don't know if you recognize uh, this guy. This is um, the manager again now of Chelsea. Um, and I think he epitomizes uh, more than anybody that one of the, one of the again, the mantras that, that you have to back yourself because, you know, it's going to be, uh, there are challenges, uh, there are difficulties. And, uh, but, you know, if you don't believe in yourself, you don't back yourself, it's going to be very difficult to, uh, to overcome some of those, those challenges. So, you know, maybe he takes it into overdrive, but certainly uh, he's a good example. So I think I'm on the, the last slide here. And, um, you know, this, this is a question that, that you may ask yourself, and maybe it's asked in, as part of the program, uh, but why, why do this? Why, why would you want to do this? Why would you want to take the risk? Why would you want to put yourself through this? Why would you not want to have salary for a year and a half? Um, no guarantee of... of uh, you know, pension or any of that kind of stuff. And some people might, might say, um, I can make a lot of money. Some people might say, because um, uh, I'll be in control of my destiny. And, you know, I think you, you probably have to figure this out for yourself. Um, but I think it has to be a reason that's going to carry you through, you know, the ups and downs of, of setting up a business. And, and I suppose my message here is that to be an entrepreneur is a privilege because as an entrepreneur you get to make an impact on society and in our case we are hoping to bring new treatments for people dying with cancer so that that's a privilege you know the money everything else you know you, you would like to think that might follow but being an entrepreneur you're in charge you can control your destiny and you can make an impact and that's it. That's my uh, that's my presentation.